Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. You see the smiles on our faces, man? Eastman and Laird uh, stopped by to take a look at Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, issue number four with us, picking up that conversation uh, directly where we left it off. Do we need a filibuster? Do we need a preamble? Watch the video. Uh, let's let's get started right away. And yep. uh, on on the uh, we have Kevin Eastman, Peter Laird. Man, we're going to pick up where we left off. Man, talking Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles issue four. But uh, at the PO box, we we just received a package. Jimmy, can you grab that stuff, man? Showing off some of Kevin's fresh new artwork. It's the wax work TMNT movie soundtrack uh, hmm. vinyl records, man. For all three. Pete, have Have you seen these, Pete? I have not. I am going to send you a set. Yeah, okay. check, check this out, man. Kevin Eastman putting that duo tone to use, uh, wow. doing a kind of origin story of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on the inside jacket of... Uh, that's that's the, Well, actually, that, let me um, just a quick... I'll give you a quick, really short background on it. Is, uh, so, um, you know, um, uh, they originally did the, the movie soundtrack with all the, the, hit, the hit songs on it. And then this company, really unique company called Waxworks Records... Um, who does these wonderful collections of the actual soundtrack. So John Dupree, who did the actual uh, score for the movies, and it was one of the things they reached out to me um, four or five years ago and said, hey, we're we're going to release these. Would you like to do some artwork for them? And I said, of course, um, I'd love to. And so um, over the last five years, we've done three, and the third one just came out now uh, for movie three. But what they had me do is they they said you can do whatever you want on the covers and I would send a few sketches in and then on the inside two page spread of um the first movie I retold the movie on duo shade <laughs> in these clips in the entire um in the entire spread so that's basically the you know like the guy that used to do micro machines it's a it's a really abridged version <laughs> of the first movie um but then I would design these labels and and do other stuff and put some posters in and then with movie two, um, I did some of our favorite moments from there, you know, Token Razar, and then the uh, the Super Shredder, of course, on the back, and then uh, um, on the inside it was sort of that scene where they were jumping up out of the uh, in the lab. That that scene when they found the TG, I think TGRI was that they used in the movie, and then you know a few of the characters, and then for movie three, which just came out just a, um, a little while ago, so they they did them about a year and a half apart. Um, and for movie three, um, I did this funny kind of flip thing where um, when you open the two page spread on the top is, um, well, uh, yeah, this one one with the spinning time scepter in the middle, then on the top is them in Japan. And then the other one is when they were, you know, um, still in New York and stuff. And it's and it's just fun. And, I, you know, it's, it's they're they're generally pretty limited, I guess, in, in their release and. You know, I don't know a lot about what they do, but I've looked on their website and they have some pretty interesting, you know, like everything from, you know, De Niro movies or Tarantino movies, but it's all score. And then they do, you know, Big Trouble and Little. Uh, it's a wide variety of these little special editions for a very selective crowd. Um, but I've got all three and I will. I've got because I got some other fun stuff I, I threatened I'd send you anyway. Um, so I'm gonna I'll, I'll put them in a package for you, Pete, and send them your way. That was great, man. Thank you. One yeah, of the of one of the other pieces that we got sent was a uh, it was an Aeon Flux movie. Uh, uh, I mean, a, a soundtrack for Aeon Flux box set. Peter Chung, and uh, Peter Chung did uh, a lot of design work on the cartoon, the TMNT cartoon, and designed that like iconic opening sequence uh did all the storyboards and stuff for that so did you guys ever meet him or or talk to him did, did you know of his existence uh i don't think i ever did no it what did he what did he do did he, he did something with the turtles oh like yeah, the, yeah um the opening credits sequence he storyboarded for the, for the first turtle movie for the, uh, the animated show, series yeah, the cartoon. oh the animated um, i'm sorry the first turtle animated series really yeah 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 hmm. Yeah, I did not know that because I've I've um, I've met him several times and and I've never he never mentioned that up. He's kind of a nutty guy, but it's like uh, but I, I remember on Liquid Television when Ian Flux came out and uh, enjoyed it quite a lot. He did it. Um, you kind of you know it, it is you know very traditional anime kind right. of style, but um, no, but I did I did not know he he did that because that's always that's something that I I definitely. Um, 
love to mention I I because I always love talking to fans about um, the fact that Chuck Lorre wrote the original theme yeah. song for um, you know the first Turtle cartoon show, which was yeah. which was pretty funny. Yeah, but no, that's a that's a great factoid. I did not know. That's cool. Yeah, super cool, man. Uh, off the bat, let's take a look at this spread by by Uncle Peter Laird. 1985 yeah. is the copyright date for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles issue number four. So we, we mentioned it before. You guys trade off covers. So Ke- Kevin yeah. did uh, the car chase in issue three. We have Peter Laird mm-hmm. on the at the helm right here. So impressive. My only, my only complaint was I, I wish Pete put more detail in the background. I don't know. <laughs> Quite. <laughs> No, as I, I had mentioned this before in some of our other one of our other discussions, is that one of the coolest things about um, Peter Laird's machinery and uh, robotics and things like that to me, they always felt like they in the real world they could actually work. Um, you know, even even under comic book science. Um, but I love uh, I love this and and certainly um, his use of uh, separating the duo shade um, with the backgrounds and the characters being on the forefront is just an, an absolutely exquisite exquisite cover of, of many great covers, but that's a beautiful yeah. one. I appreciate that sentiment, Kevin. And uh, I have to say that it's probably my favorite of all the covers I did for the comics. Um, and I was looking at it again for this, uh, this discussion made me realize how one of the things I loved about Jack Kirby's work, especially, was his crazy machinery. And I, I tried to emulate that that approach of his when I when I drew that cover, but he he used to do such amazing crazy machinery. I, I just loved it. Yeah, it's it's so fantastic, and you guys really stretch those chops within the next uh, three four issues of mm-hmm. uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles series, down to designing the TCRI building, which has a very interesting facade. But uh, while we look through these comics, I would love to also just have a conversation about uh, the time and place that these comics uh, were, were created in. Uh, for instance, I know that we're going to get a reprint of T- Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4 uh, at, at, at some point with a Michael mm. Dooney painting that's basically doing a ver- his painted version of this, which is the right. iconic image that's like on the label of the NES video game. Yeah. So we're curious about, we'll be curious about, you know, when did Steve Levine and the other guys start coming in, when you guys start publishing other books. Mm. Uh, that, that, that sort of stuff uh, is, is, is worth making note of. Kevin, you mentioned a place called Southern Duchess Press that you guys uh, would would use uh, at, at at a later date, and if if that comes into play while we're looking at these comics, please bring that up. We also uh, we were looking at ElfQuest, and we saw that there was a printer in Poughkeepsie, New York, that did the reprint from 1989. And I wonder if you know that was the same printer that you guys uh, used. Maybe you wouldn't even have known that information or anything. But all this stuff okay. is stuff that the ch- the people at the channel love. Yeah, and, and I think the place was called Southern Duchess Nudes. Yeah, it was um, you know, I was trying to think. Um, immediately went right to. Um, I feel like we were back in Northampton by the time we were working on this one, um, because I believe we'd done issue three by the time we'd gotten back there. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Pete, but I'm I'm, I'm reaching now because I'm going like, oh my goodness, because that that makes sense about time wise that we'd be back there, but um, but I I might be might be wrong but the uh, but i do know that um southern duchess news was uh um if i remember the guy's name correctly was john de santo or john yeah, de santo yeah you got yeah, it john de santo and i forget where he approached us because I, I think you and i were having some frustration with um um uh, the uh, lakewood journal was it lakewood journal uh the that was printing like issue two because i'm I remember they that's when they really messed up issue two and we did all that sorting at your lake house uh the place you and janine were running up on the lake for um, issue two and shipping him out um and then uh issue three we had the mess up with the uh, the blotchy cover for one of the events we were doing um but there was somewhere along the line i he approached us somewhere and i don't remember where and said yeah. you know i do i have a you know a printing company so we switched to him and i thought we switched to him for Possibly issue four and possibly, um, uh, I think by the time we were doing issue five, when we reduced the size um, to more comic book size, I think that was with Southern Duchess. But I don't, can't remember exactly. Do you, do you have a better memory of that? Um, not much of a better memory. Um, but I believe that uh, John got in touch with us kind of out of the blue 
when we were uh, working on, I think, issue four, and made this wonderful offer to us to basically take all the crap work out of out of our hands and have them do it. Um, and, and by crap work, I mean all the breaking down the boxes and, and counting out the com issues numbers, I mean the, the copy numbers for the, the uh, various places that we were drop shipping to. And then they would handle all the drop shipping, which was at the time we just thought was fantastic because we were really getting really sick of doing it ourselves. <laughs> I think, yeah, because we used to go through the boxes. Like, I think as you mentioned last time was uh, just for quality control. And that was some of the Lake World Journal issues. But it was uh, um, there was um, quite, a, quite a large number of distributors at that time. And I, I want to say potentially somewhere around uh, 15 to 20. And so there, as you already said, Pete, there was a number of dropship locations. And that was one of the exciting things about what Southern Duchess News would do is they would they would, based on the instructions and the and, and what we give for numbers, that they would drop ship directly to those um, distributors, sub distributors. So yeah, mm -hmm. that was, that yeah was, and it worked out great. Would you yeah. guys, you know, this is a two man operation, but I wonder, would you put your significant others to uh, to, to work helping out with some of that stuff before you had some drop ship help and things? No, it was, as I recall, it was all me and Kevin, and, and then when Steve moved on to Sharon, Connecticut, he he would help us with that. But luckily, we would have the support of Janine Laird with the most wonderful muffins in the world when we finished the hard day of work. She was like, she would just make these muffins that I make you mouth water just thinking about them. Mm. Pete, you have our you have our address, Pete. Just in case she makes a new round. Let's jump into the body of the comic. The videos are brought to you by the books that we make, but uh, the videos are also uh, sustained by uh, the Patreon support at uh, our various levels. You can hit the description in uh, the below this video to see what could suit your needs. And uh, depending on your level of support, you're seeing us record uh, our entire sessions before anybody else, and you're getting uh, videos before anybody else does. Uh, completely mitigates the kayfabe effect, but. We do have books out in the wild and books that are forthcoming. Jimmy, what do you have? Hulk Grand Design, Street Angel Deadly Squirrel Live, and The Plain Janes are all of my books that are in print and available now. My next book, Street Angel, Princess of Poverty, will be out in May from Image Comics. You can start pre-ordering that now. It's completely different comics than Deadly Squirrel Live and will complete the Street Angel set. Uh, coming in May, uh, Red Room Crypto Killers issue one. Printed up the cover right there, man. Uh, that's your regular cover. You guys have been asking about uh, sketch covers. So we're gonna put one of those out for uh, Red Room Crypto's Killers issue number one coming out in May. There are two existing trade paperbacks of that out there. Uh, here's the cover for issue two. Your store might be able to sell, to uh, offer you that one right now. A lot of people have been asking, man, is Jimmy gonna do a variant for issue one? Let me show you guys just a little a little glimpse <laughs> of uh, Jimmy's cover, man. We'll, we'll announce that at a, at a later date, but. Some of you guys know what that is, man. Two existing trade paperbacks of Red Room out there right now, Antisocial Network and uh, Trigger Warnings. Four volumes, Hip Hop Family Tree, celebrating its 10-year anniversary. Hit my link in the description below, man. Like, I got an announcement uh, about that in, in the not-too-far uh, future. Three volumes, X-Men Grand Design and WYSIWYG are out there in the wild right now. We thank you guys so much for supporting our books. We thank you so much for supporting the channel through the Patreon. Now that we're done paying the bills, let's get back to Kevin and Peter. Uh, off the bat, uh, panel one, the Jim Shooter Tenets. Every comic is somebody's first comic, so you have this little caption piece bringing new readers up to speed, which is a fantastic piece to put in into the comic. And the thing that I identified while reading this is uh, these guys have more than 100 pages of TMNT under their belt. Confident mm. storytellers, man. We're getting little glimpses of B stories. It's clearly a series, too. This is going to be continuing into the next. We're, we're setting up some seeds with some voyeurism, with telescopic lenses and <laughs> shit like it. Like, these guys, are, these guys are firing at this point. Most definitely. <laughs> <laughs> or, or it's like, I think we used to call it, trying to figure shit out. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was... Uh, um, I think that was sort of the wonderfully organic nature of some of this... Um, stuff is that we would have you know a good outline we'd talk out the idea enough of where we wanted to go and what moments we wanted to um within the story then it was kind of breaking it down to fit into uh 
um, fit into the beast, but it was, uh, I don't know, it just, it, it just seemed different kinds of things evolved within the moments that we, we wanted to hit as a, as a story along the way, I guess, uh, for lack of a better, better description. <laughs> and, Pete, uh, Peter, do you mind if I read, uh, a, the text you sent me about these, like how sort of malleable the, the turtles became? Oh, no. Is it okay? Let me yeah. pull that up real quick. Okay. So this is what you texted me, uh, when we were prepping for, for last recording session. Uh, mm -hmm. Peter's words. One thing that strikes me about the first five issues is how quickly it became evident how flexible and adaptable the turtles were. I mean, we went from ninja on ninja mayhem in the first issue, battling techno terrorism in the second, to uh, a wild, nearly issue long car chase in the third issue, to TCRI aliens in issue four, and often to adventures in outer space in the fifth issue, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, that's it's very well said um, what Pete said, and that's and it's perfectly spot on and what i love is that when you think about um a couple of goofballs that were basically writing and and wanting to draw stuff that we wanted to draw i think by the time we arrived at the idea of going to out of space it was because we both were really huge fans of star wars <laughs> we we love that and we and so we it, it was you know i want to say story story first of course but we we wanted the stories to be the good but most of all we wrote them for us we kind of wrote stories that we thought would be fun to not only um draw and, and and stories we'd like to read and so when we did um each of these stories and, and and it was um that wonderful discovery that they were very valuable and and what i think is um exceptional is that when you look at the first um 11 issues plus the one shots um making up the first 15 issues which to me is the the absolute solid core of anything and everything that um, became the turtles from that point on was based on, on those, those 15 issues. Um, it was really the, you know, the, the, the bad guys and the foot and, and, and Casey and April and the family and the Triceratons. And there was so many pieces that I, I still love to see, <clears throat> you know, even in the most recent, you know, cartoon as late as the 2012 series that Ciro did is, you know, all those characters that they pulled from when I went into the, you know, I'd go into the animation studios um, and, and hang out with the guys and see what they were doing. But one of the things that Ciro nearly put all around the studio was all the original Mirage Studios covers and stories. And, and so when you when he looked at ideas, he went straight to the original source material, um, you know, so the Fugitoid and the Triceratons and, and things and, and, and things that were adapted out of out of that was that that core foundation to this day is still the the, the structural foundation of all things turtles so, in, yeah. in the spirit of uh, being young cartoonists who are kind of getting some some footing under 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 your feet with when it comes to uh, making comics so you do this two-page spread and then you have the lettering go across the two pages and then when, when you when you get that back from the printer what goes through your mind <laughs> I honestly can't say that I remember anything that went through my mind at that moment. Because <laughs> certainly, uh, what, like in the paperback books and things, like you know, you're cutting off the lettering. But that's that's like a youthful, that's like a youthful thing where you gotta you gotta t learn some lessons sometimes, man. When it comes well, to well, production. You know, well, it's interesting. Like one of the one of the versions you showed was really heavily in the gutter. You know, we were again, we were we were figuring out and, and as we you know learning as we go. But then, like, when you look at the most recent version, which you're holding there, is like when IDW reprinted this, my frustration was, why do you have that, you know, inch and a half gap in the middle? You couldn't match up the pages because right. they did the size. It was a, They printed it in a different size and tried to adapt to it. But it was, we were really figuring out this stuff as as we went. And, yeah. you know, as you said, when you were talking about page count, you know, Pete and I had done stories, individual stories on our own, but I don't think any of my stories went past 10 pages and i and you know pete maybe a little bit more around the same but i think when we started doing these you know very large epic stories it was um you know we 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 were learning together and, and piecing together you know movements and layouts and structures and 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 trying to figure out those spreads because we loved our jack kirby spreads and s splashes and those kind of things so it was really a you know flying by the you know woolbur and all of her, you know, the, the Wright brothers here, you know, just figuring shit out as we went in our own little, you know, pea brains. But to have and you make, oh, sorry. 
No, go ahead. <laughs> you make you make a good point about that that word balloon that that goes over the gutter, and I wonder if part of the reason that was done that way was that that two page spread may have been drawn on a single sheet of duo shade, and having it having the drawing be on this single sheet and not having a, an actual split in the middle may have led us to not really consider where that word balloon was going to fall once it was printed. Uh, one, 100%. One of the extremely smart instincts that you guys have as storytellers is uh, giving vulnerability to, to your characters, letting them mm -hmm. take a little bit of damage, letting them get a little bit impaired, and it does create a warmth and humanity to the characters we see we see mike getting catching a glance and blow uh right, right. there and we're going to see some more thro throughout the, the the next issues of the turtles they're, they're not they're not gods you right. know they're not uh unstoppable forces you know they they are for lack of a better word human and you guys you guys uh, stay stay tuned into that it creates good suspense and things i think yeah, in fact in fact the 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 humanity of them, their vulnerability, is actually plays a important role in the culmination of this particular particular story in issue four. Yeah, where Michelangelo tries to make a move in, in the TCRI building and accidentally falls from where he's trying to hang on because of the wound on his arm has weakened him. Yep, and that's what sets off the translocation machine that beams him into space. It's yeah, I think it was, um, and, de and definitely the one of the things I think Pete and I really loved about um, vulnerability in characters that made him more believable, whether it be, you know, um, characters from our hero, Jack Kirby, of course, and, and other comics that we read. But there was, you know, something about um, a real underdog hero, maybe like the Indiana Jones type as a, as a, as a, as a um, reference is that, you know, it's it's you know the, the hard fought battle is the best you know and to win to overcome such incredible odds to 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 mm -hmm. succeed if you're just a a person that's an average person that wants to be um just an average person but when you have to um you know rise up and and you know like you know um bilbo baggins if you will or or frodo or, you know some of these things that you know you want that every everyday person um to 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 succeed and so you have to show the vulnerability to make it to make it work and i think that's that's kind of the stuff whether we did it probably self subconsciously that we love that about heroes that we like to read about mm. um that we just n naturally um gravitated to that kind of mechanism when we were uh, writing the stories I want to compare this uh, this color treatment from the first collections because we see a lot of stuff drop out. Backgrounds, yeah. shadows, a lot of those details in the black and white you see are done in that duo shade. You know, yeah. whole buildings and skies and things. When you went to the color version, do you remember kind of looking at the art and thinking this is a chance to to make changes? You know, maybe to simplify in some cases. And and worth noting that it is Steve Levine on the colors uh, on the, uh, the the first editions now. Uh, I, I don't really have an answer for that because I didn't have anything to do with doing the color, as far as I can recall. No, but what what you did do and, and it was um, um, was great from the beginning was uh, um, I think just in case um, you know there were ever any issues with the duo shade, um, you know Peter introduced me to the world of photocopying just for for archives and storage and things. But we would always. Um, uh, photocopy the pencils, um, uh, and I and, and we'd also photocopy the inks before we did the duo shade effects, um, which was just. I'm not sure it was it was just a good idea, and I think we just said if there was ever a problem or something, I don't know why, but we we wanted to preserve the steps for some reason, and so what was interesting was that when we did get to do the color versions. We had a, a clean set of um, just the ink drawings without the duo shade effects, which, you know, that was the fun part about the duo shade effects is that you could put those in just as shadows would just duo shade, which would give you this wonderful sense of depth. And so when we did the color, um, instead of, you know, asking Steve to recreate what we'd done specifically in the duo shade, and I think it was also a time thing in this, the, uh, um, the, the, the challenges that working on 
the coloring at that time, which is this blue line system where, you know, they would have the ink art on a piece of acetate and expose it onto a piece of watercolor paper. And so you'd have this kind of faint blue line that you then colored on that blue line and then laid the black plate over. And so it was moving back and forth. So I think that, you know, doing backgrounds that Steve could then cut out frisket and just airbrush it as opposed to try to put in a lot of detail was just the need to service a deadline um, that maybe first comic set up or, or something, but it was, um, it was quite a process. So yeah, that was the preservation of the artwork in all the different stages was something that um, um, I really strongly remember that Pete started and, and it's something we stuck with for, um, you know, throughout the run and really, for many, many issues afterwards. It's really good to have that like high fidelity piece that you can color because like you, sometimes you could see color over top of duotone in, in comics using the old mechanical process and it morays you. It's unreliable. You never could tell. But I, I lingered on this spread because there are so many buildings and things that are just drawn in duotone and it looks like it's one hand. And I wonder if of, if you know one guy or the other did those pieces or were you both comfortable uh, drawing in duo tone uh, it's hard to say which one of us did each each uh, duo tone background yeah but i think we were both pretty comfortable with it if it was if it was really good i did it <laughs> <laughs> no but um to 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 um yeah what pete said it was it was something that um um, I particularly when I look back sometimes, and even when I use duo shade now, I feel like um, um, I often overuse it, and and so sometimes it was really a um, you get used to not wanting any white space, and then you have to sort of take a step back and think about like you know like this TCRI building is a perfect example is um, you know when you choose the layers of duo shade from the the first shade to the you know the lighter shade to the darker shade if you do it right you can present this wonderful um perception of depth and 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 distance and things um and uh but yeah that was uh but i think i think we 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 definitely um certainly at this stage and and in a lot of the early stages for most of the books we were we were passing it back and forth um, um regularly just you know to there's that great TCRI uh, building design, fantastic design. So, so unique. Stands out so much from the buildings around it that right. have that old weathered look. And that TCRI building looks new, science fiction, different Be architecture. Becomes a storytelling piece. I swear this turtle composition right here, is that not in the arcade game? Like where they're looking <laughs> at the city on fire, like this exact composition, but also keeping up with the with the comics of the day every comic is somebody's new comic so you get a very truncated snappy origin of the teenage mutant ninja turtles like it's just such smart professional instincts as uh, as creators to to include those bits well thank you i said you know just to, that design the building design was definitely pete's um because it's awesome it's great and uh um but yeah i think that was um you know for you know that's one of the things you know that you know those flashback moments or those setup moments because there's a really big moment when they actually see the yeah the logo they recognize it from the the ooze canister and and, uh, and so you want to put that in perspective and I think I always I always kind of liked that when they did it in comics when we were reading them <laughs> you know it's like you know remember this from issue blah 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 you know but it was uh, anyway and that would be the thing with like the uh, Frank Miller Daredevils if you read them in order. Because it was Jim Shooter era, the origin would be told in every comic. <laughs> so it's like, you know which page to kind of ignore to read it as a novel. Like, Frank Miller set it up as, like, a continuing single work. But just skip that page. Right. A little towel snapping there. We're going to come back to this later with some some, uh, some other <laughs> comics that, that, that we got our, our hands on to show you guys. Actually, I wonder if we could just go back a couple pages. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to know something. On page um, uh, 10 and 11, you know, Kevin did the layouts for this book. And this sequence on these two pages is something that I've always really enjoyed because it, it really says Kevin to me that mm -hmm. where Michelangelo and a couple of the foot soldiers fall off the edge of the building. Yes. And Michelangelo is, is fortunate in that he's able to grab onto the uh, laundry line. <laughs> I forgot about that. 
swing into the building, crash through the window and disturb the, this couple who are making out on the couch. And I just love it. It's, it's so it's so awesome and the movement and the, and the uh, co sort of comedy of it. And that's that is really part and parcel of what what Kevin brings to the the, the table. Great two page gag. I was I was going to bring it up earlier when we were looking at it because so much is done here, man. Set up about the kids. What yes. about the kids? You know, Cagney and Lacey's over. So like you know, like let's root this in a period of time. <laughs> yes. Uh, and then uh, just the storytelling instincts here are so perfect. We establish the kids, lands. We still have the couple, and then establishing the kids. And that gaze with our guy looking at the lady, that's the way to end a gag like that. It's such a perfect whole moment. It's even of a theme because we're going to end up with the bra on the head, but not from the lady on the couch, but actually from the the, line, the laundry line that uh, he gets snagged on. <laughs> I also think the uh, sound effect when my Angel comes crashing through the window is fantastic. And I can't remember <laughs> if you did that, Kevin, or if Steve did. I, we did that because it was, um, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, and I was looking at some of the original layouts because I, I, I think, I was trying to figure out which issue I stopped lettering. And um, and I think, I want to say it was like either six or seven, but I'm not 100% sure. But it was, but we, again, using the, um, the, 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 the black and white photocopies um, that we had when we were transitioning to color, well, you'll notice when you see the first comics version, we actually had Pete go back in and re-letter all of them yeah. in much more, you know, um, uh, nicer um, handwriting than I, than I had. Yeah, Steve and, Levine uh, did, that, did that lettering job. Uh, but we did the, but we did it initially. So that, yeah. that smish, that was actually in the artwork. So that would have been something that Pete and I did um, in the actual on the physical artwork, anything that was in the balloons was something that Steve went back in and did later. Um, but all the sound effects um, in general, and we we used them on certain moments, and I, I I feel like we used them to good effect without overusing them because right. um, you know just I don't know it was just because um, I, I you know at some point I think some comics had every you know, click, wuzzle, and wugga, wugga, that was, uh, you know, that was the sound effect. And, you, you even oh use, a, God. use some Teenage Mutant uh, lettering on Omatopoeia around here, because I saw a BAMF or two Yep. Uh, on yes. here. Were you guys yeah. working in the same studio again at this point? I think when we talked to you last time around issue two or three, you, you know, you were living like, uh, I think, in different cities and, and trading pages. But at this point, do you remember if you were back together? And if so, were you working in the same space every day? No, we were living in the same town, Sharon, Connecticut. And uh, Kevin actually stayed with my wife and I for, I can't remember, was it a few weeks, Kevin, when you moved down? Yeah. So we were able to do that, you know, work in the same space. But then he got a, an apartment that he ended up sharing with Steve Levine. And uh, I can't remember if we got together very often to, to draw like we had done in, in Dover. This is yeah, I think we, we um, but it was definitely, we'd, you know, every, we'd see each other, other every day and trade off pages and, 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 you know, talk about this and that. And a lot of times it was a, a good excuse to go to Pete's house and get out the rubber wraps and go float around on the lake for a little while, especially when it was nice out. <laughs> um, but uh, you, <laughs> but I think um, but you yeah, were definitely in the in the same town and uh, doing that stuff. But I I want to point something out here real quick because I think it's funny and I want to ask Pete. Um, you see on the on the page there where it has um, uh, April, you know, talking, and then the, that one panel where there's somebody looking through a um, a spyglass. Yes, smoking cigarettes. Yeah, right there. We set that up. And I don't think we ever paid that off ever. No, we didn't. And I and I honestly can't remember who we ex intended that to be. Or if it was just a wide open possibility. That's so funny because here's how here's how as like a removed reader like myself took that. Uh, even though he's smoking, so it'd be be out of character. But uh, Casey Jones just shows up like whenever they come back, whenever they come back to uh, Earth and they're they're mixing it up with um shredder like if you read all four of the uh first graphic novels together that's how, that's how, that's my interpretation because because casey jones automatically knows where to show up 
But he's mm. got the cigarette, and I don't think Casey would be a smoker. Yeah. But I was going to bring this piece up, man, because I, I and I was going to tell him myself, because I was going to be like, yeah, so you built in Casey Jones staring at them so that he could show up for issues later. I think it was, I feel like it was something like, I don't think, I'm pretty sure, you know, pretty positive it wasn't Casey in in that scenario, but I think it was, we had an idea for something, um, and I, I think it was just something that, we just never paid because somebody actually pointed it out to me once and they go you know hey who was that? who was that i was like uh i don't know i don't know <laughs> it feels like that's something that we've come across in other serial storytelling sure especially early on where it's almost like you're you're establishing some spinning plates that you can then go back to um it's pretty cool to find one that, that you guys didn't get back around to yeah yeah idw is going to do a 20 issue limited <laughs> series on it now uh, one one small thing I wanted to just go back a, a page or two. Yes. Page uh, 16. There's the panel in the bottom right, which has a, a real charming kind of throwback look to the underground comics with the way the, the perspective is on the building. Yes. It, it awesome. just kind of reminds me of an R. Crumb drawing for some reason. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I love those. That's a that's a that's a, such a fun shot. I think I still use that a lot. That that sort of style with that. You you see the second time around shop and the and the van parked out front and yeah. uh, and all that. But yeah, that was you know I think that was that was probably definitely some of the uh, underground influence creeping in. Um, and uh, we we love doing those city shots. Or, Not know. shy about it, man. Three point perspective and all that. And look at that ambitious view right there. I, I'm glad you, you pointed that out because that's one of my favorite panels from this issue. And uh, really, again, speaks to Kevin's brilliance and, and laying out the, the books. Uh, I, I would never have tried that. But he, he uh, there's a certain fearlessness to Kevin's layouts and drawing that I, I really admire. And that's a, a great example of it. It's It's a form of personal cat burglary because um, I'm sure I stole that from either Kirby or Corbin or something. <laughs> I was going to ask about Corbin. We were looking at Ralph not too long ago and, and, and he would be very, very uh, ambitious in his figure work and, and give you angles that you never see a monthly cartoonist try because mm. it would require some erasing and some planning and, you know, some, some extra skills for sure. Great choreography. You know, it was, but that was, that was, um, you know, again, it leans heavily on, um, um, you know, Pete, you know, Pete and I learning together and learning as we were going through these series. And so that we um, were, we'd approach it in a way again, that, that, you know, to choose it, to do a panel like that was just something like, you know, well, this is different. It's unique. And, and it's almost, you know, you can build a, a page on it. And I, and, you know, I can get into some lame ass sort of philosophical of why I chose to do that. And I was just, there's nothing more than, oh uh, this might be cool you know kind of thing and um you, you just kind of figure your way through but you you do approach it like you know pete and i were fans of a, a lot of great tv shows and movies and stuff so you sort of will flash to certain things that you remember a setup in a movie or something that you um the se sequential order of storytelling in a, a project that makes um the beats that you pick and certainly what we were doing had to be very specific, but it was, I'm, I'm definitely laying in more logic to it than it was. Cause it was more of a gut feeling that you, you, you kind of, you, you kind of, you did. I mean, we just pointed out a, a key setup for something we set up that we never paid off. So it was still, so <laughs> but that was a fun, like this, this whole thing here was like, I don't even know where this came from the whole, how do they sneak into the building? And uh, you know, luckily Donatello had a, you know, a Polaroid, ca Polaroid camera, and some this. some hooks on ropes and shit. They got it all. <laughs> yeah, this is leading up to one of my favorite sequences in the book. The whole thing where he whips out the pigeon puppet and the oh yeah, Polaroid camera. yeah yeah genius. And always pulling the 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 wool over the the poor security guy's eyes, man. Mm. This, this kind of stuff, man, it was in the Konami NES video game where you go building the building on the on the um, little hook rope thing. Mm -hmm. Makes me wonder, were you guys looking at like um, 
martial arts magazines or like uh, ninja magazines. As a kid, I would see ads for stuff and they would have like those hooks and they would have all kinds of wild, you know, weapons, I guess. Uh, Mm -hmm. Were you looking at that stuff and thinking, oh, we can use this. Let's add the grappling hook to the turtles. I don't I don't remember any specific attempts to uh, draw inspiration from that kind of publication, but I'm sure we did buy a few martial arts magazines at the time. I, I actually, I still have a few of the, uh, it was something um, I feel like we found in a, um, um, like occasionally we'd do a goof off Sundays or one of those days where you do some, do some tag sailing or do some, hit some bookstores. And, and like when we would drive over to uh, even go over to the printer, go over to, you know, Torrington and heading over to Poughkeepsie oh. for uh, dropping stuff off, I'd be hitting bookstores. And I had, I ended up with, and I still have surprisingly a bunch of these, and it's like um, maybe four or five, um, uh, some of those photographs, short, you know, uh, digest size, ninja stuff. And it's just like how to be a ninja or, or something like that. And uh, it was just, um, um, you know, they would show you some step-by-step movements or, you know, some of the some of the weapons used. But I also remember some of it, I think, might have been gleaned from, you know, um, martial arts movies and stuff right. that we saw um, that we'd, we'd see different, different stuff. But it was... Um, yeah, so it was, it was probably a a bit of the, all of the above. Yeah, Kim, Kim, you just mentioned something that made me flash on uh, something very memorable from that period, which was when we we'd drive to Torrington to go to the comic book store, probably the the best named comic book store ever. My mother threw mine away. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was his name Jack or something like that, but yeah, it was like- you're, you're right, Jack. And he was, um, he was, I was always frustrated with his store because it reminded me of the printer because his store was a, you know, I can see why his mother threw his away because his store was a wreck. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it was very messy. Like, you know, it, you know, we'd love to, the smell of a comic store and you like to go in and go through the back issue bins and this and that. And, you know, and uh, I just remember like sometimes his organization wasn't all that it should be. So if you wanted to go through the back issue bin, sometimes he had stuff piled on there. So you had to move stuff to get to the comics underneath and but it was the whole exercise was just was great and i've often brought up that story about um one of my favorite names of a comic store ever which was my mother threw mine away that was fantastic i just read the blog that chuck rosansky uh wrote about uh finding that uh, edward church collection and uh mm-hmm. the way that he paid for each of the 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 collection was by by chicken box he called it because it was pre long box but like the proprietors at the time would have like a specific kind of Purdue chicken box or something wow. that kind of like held issues. And he lays it out. He's like, each one would hold, you know, 300 modern comics or, or uh, you know, 200 uh, golden age comics. And that's how he, he, you know, paid for that giant, you know, the mile high collection. Uh, this page, man, we get to see the Ninja Turtles being ninjas uh, in terms of stealth. Yes. As opposed to just martial arts, one of the great two-page sequences of this issue. I like where one of them's up on the light. Right, right yeah. <laughs> and we find out a couple of pages later, man, Raphael, he's up there on the light. They say it right here, where's where's Raph at? Up on the light, where else? <laughs> like, you know, it's just another, yeah. it's just another Sunday. Yeah. And then another one of the super memorable sequences, the big, uh, the splinter reveal. Uh, great oh, technology. Right. Yeah. Look at how much like the line art version looks like Kirby. Yeah. You know, you, you mentioned that earlier this episode, you guys, but when you remove the duo shade, it really feels like that with some of the big blocky blacks and yeah, stuff. Yeah, and the squiggly. Yeah, we definitely leaned heavy. We love that that manic stuff that Kirby would do and you just it would just be so abstract and so graphic, but you know, you just you believed it would work. I don't know. It was just one of those things and it's just like, yeah, well, of course it works. <laughs> Especially back in the days when he was working on Fantastic Four and he'd have these Reed Richards inventions that were just outrageous, you know, just amazing. Oh, that was, you know, just, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was fantastic. I know yeah, those, those, that Fantastic Four run was just fantastic yeah yeah great. absolutely man uh great great reveal because we haven't seen splinter in a while man so uh reuniting the turtles with splinter even in that way uh it needs a splash page yes more more great storytelling uh instincts there and uh the issues that we've read you know in preparation for this conversation with kevin eastman and peter laird 
imagination is the first thing that comes to mind, man, because just so much great design work that, uh, you know, during the black and white boom, when these comics would come out, sometimes people would come up with their cool elevator pitch and it could sustain an issue and, and it kind of falls, falls off quick. You guys are introducing fresh stuff all the time. It is in the spirit of Kirby, where mm. you know you introduce Boom Tube on one pa page and then Dark Side on the next. Mm. Fantastic designs here. Well, that was the you know these are the um, the uh, design of the Utrams were were just fantastic. I love these. Like um, it, it it gave me nightmares having to draw them panel to panel. <laughs> <they were> just, <laughs> the design was fantastic. Again, a great Peter Laird design of, of of making that work. Not only like the the weapons and the guns and and but just the whole the whole thing was just um, yeah it was just it was just brilliant. It was it's really it's uh, unforgettable. I have to point out here, though, that I did draw a lot of inspiration from the Terminator uh, for the robot bodies. The, yep. uh, when you'd see the, the, the Terminator stripped of his human skin, that's what they basically looked like. Great that was, Yeah. No, I think that was, um, you know, the, 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 you know, and I to repeat, you know, the risk of repeating myself because I do it often, but the, uh, but I think that was, you know, again, you got two guys um, where the, um, you know, the the, the writers, um, the artists, the, the publishers, the editors, um, in, in, even in this case, I think at, at that point, I was probably still lettering. So whatever went into these issues was stuff that we were inspired by and wanted to draw and we wanted to see. So, you know, um, leaning on some of our favorite um, genre things like the Terminator or like... Um, you know, Blade Runners or Star Wars or you name it. Um, it was it was definitely something. Um, you, you know, it was exciting to us because <clears throat> you know it's like we that's what we wanted to draw. That was I remember seeing the Terminator in the theater and going like, "What?" You know, it was just one of these great. You know, um, you know, it just yeah. You know, so it was it was fun to be able to do that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, being able yeah. to oscillate between the original duo duo shade uh, printed versions and the Levine colors uh, for situations like this where it's it's almost different it's different media in terms of the the art making and you you're bound by black and white in the issues so the little special effects that you get by doing the duo tone and then you hit it with some white out over top to give that kind of dematerialization or even this kind of translucent kind of vibe and then it's fun to compare uh, with what Levine did with the color and he has mm. more tools you know is able to airbrush outside of right. the characters and things uh, it's just it's really fun to uh, comp compare and contrast these bits and, and what what a great conclusion you know like like uh, we know what is going on uh, for next issue but right here you, you, you have no idea it looks like it hurts <laughs> yes <laughs> would uh, do you guys remember would the, the last page have been on the inside uh, cover because uh, you guys were always good about having extra material in the original issues. Well, I'm holding the first printing right now, and the that last page is on the right hand side. So and then we have T-shirt iron on ad on the next page, and limited edition button sets. Ah, um, that's where that is. Somebody was just asking me for you know where that ad ran. Somebody. I'm sorry. It was just funny. I um, now I have to look that up because uh, a fan had found an original set of those buttons, and I think I, I sent you a note on that. We were trading text on it where I said, "Do you did you color these or who colored these?" But I think then somebody found that ad online and sent yeah. it. But somebody else was asking, like, "Hey, did was that ad ever printed anywhere? I'd love to get a better printing of that ad advertising the buttons." So now I know. So we'll go and <laughs> grab it. <laughs> Were you guys doing all of that stuff yourself, like shirts and buttons? Was that something you were handling? Well, we did T-shirt iron-ons for a while, where we, we just had them made at a copy shop that had a color copier that could print on a T-shirt iron-on material. But the buttons and, um, let's see, what was the other thing? I wonder if the Dark the Horse Studios by, figures start to happen around here. The buttons were done by a guy named Jeff Rudolph. Yeah. And I think he was from Connecticut. Yeah, the T-shirt irons that that was we did those ourselves, and then the buttons were done by this guy Jeff Rudolph. 
And then, uh, yeah, that, that was it for that. So let's uh, let's wrap this issue up. Uh, Kevin, what do you have coming out uh, or in the works that you would want the people to know about? Um, actually, one of the things I'm the most excited about right now is uh, the Ultimate Collection 7, which um, uh, should be should be coming out soon, which is, you know, I still love... Um, of all the many treasures, uh, turtle treasures over the years, was the, the the fact that they still do those collections in the in the hardcover form. Oh yeah, uh, and they just um, they did them even slightly larger than the actual comics uh, with the annotations and behind the scenes. So I just I was always a huge fan of um, special edition DVDs where you get to see behind the scenes and hear what the director was thinking and hear what you know just different different parts. But with a, a collection like that. Um, uh you know for the it's kind of for us but at the same time i feel like it's for the 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 the, the really hardcore fans who want to see some of that stuff which in some cases um in a lot of cases doesn't even exist anymore where um thankfully for the um the record keeping of keeping photocopies of the different stages of work or keeping copies of pencils before they were inked you know uh you know just having I've got the original Pete Laird pencil for the second printing of issue three that he penciled before Jim Lawson inked it. And so the only place that exists, because in those days you inked right on top of the pencils and that kind of stuff. So the only way you would have that is that photocopy to show fans of what some of the stuff, um, how it evolved uh, and, and how it came to be. So um, yeah, if I had to plug one thing uh, and that would be, that would be tippity top is um, Ultimate Collection 7, which would be up soon. Go get that book. And thank you guys so much for joining us uh, to take a look at uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles issue four.